you know, opportunities and impacts that is to be unlocked. So I'm hoping that uh, in today's uh, presentation uh, from Iran, we can learn about uh, how you know, Abu Dhabi and the UAE and the MBZ UAI you know, can play a role in this uh, very, very uh, important and, uh, and uh, you know, uh, how should I say, you know, very, very timely project you know, that is going to happen. It is already happening, but I think uh, it is just the start. We're going to see it's growing ever bigger in the next couple of years. Right. So uh, if you want to uh, you know, have uh, additional discussions with our speaker, uh, with uh, our university, want to build uh, uh, or strengthen and expand the ties and the partnership, uh, please do let us know. We're going to do our best to facilitate you know, a continuation of this uh, dialogue and uh, eventually, hopefully, promote partnerships and uh, business opportunities uh, and the many more uh, projects down the road. So I'd want to take more of your time. Uh, let's welcome Aaron Segal to the stage to give his second talk. Thank you. Thank you. I think I have this. Uh, have yeah. yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah, OK. Um, so um, good afternoon, everybody. And uh, thank you very much, Eric, for uh, first of all, the invitation uh, to be here. Um, I'm very excited. Uh, actually, I think only just uh, just a year ago, uh, ties uh, between Israel and uh, the UAE just uh, opened, so uh, allowing me to, to even be here. And it's such a, uh, was such nice um, uh, uh, to connect with Eric again after uh, so many years. And who would have thought, you know, 20 years ago, that uh, we would connect back uh, here in Abu Dhabi and uh, and in Israel? Um, so very excited to tell you about uh, what we're doing. I think um, right now. Uh, we are at a very interesting uh, time because um, I think, like Eric mentioned, you know, 20 years ago we did the Human Genome Project, and now there are so many different technologies in terms of uh, biological technologies that allow us to measure much, much more. Uh, data technologies to allow us to analyze the data, AI technologies, and uh, I think the intersection of all of that applied to the area of health can really take us to uh, the next generation of, uh, of medicine in general, and that's what we're trying to do, and that's what I want to tell you about today. So my talk will have um, three uh, main parts. Uh, in the first, I want to tell you the um, very broad vision of uh, how we're thinking about this and, and why uh, I think data could really revolutionize uh, the future of medicine. Then in the second part, I'll tell you about, uh, it'll be the more scientific part, but not going into very technical detail, just showing you the many different applications of this type of data that we are uh, collecting uh, and showing you how uh, on many different diseases going from cancer to uh, bowel disease to obesity, uh, how all of these data could really play a big role in where we have been making a lot of progress. And then in the third last part, uh, I want to tell you how uh, one of the key main reasons uh, for coming here after uh, Eric and his team visited us uh, at the Weizmann Institute, I want to tell you about uh, the opportunity to maybe partner and uh, perhaps establish a cohort of people like we are doing in Israel, establish such a cohort uh, here at the UAE uh, to perform similar measurements, to collaborate with us, to, uh, to expand the cohort that we are building in Israel to many different dimensions as we are trying to also uh, build it uh, more and more uh, internationally. So that will be um, the third part, and, and hopefully uh, that can um, uh, initiate then future discussions to see how we could um, make this collaboration happen. So uh, let me dive uh, uh, into it. I guess uh, being a computer scientist, uh, I really see the value in data, like uh, this famous quote by uh, Benjamin Franklin, that an investment in knowledge always pays uh, the best interest. Uh, we are really generating, I think, very unique data sets in the space of healthcare, uh, and I'll, I'll tell you about that. So, um, you know, if you think about um, where we were 20 years ago, or maybe a little bit over 20 years ago, the first draft of the human genome was published. And uh, like Eric said at the time, uh, you know, we knew very few uh, variants, genetic variants of disease, but with this technology that measured our full human genome for the first time, if you look at what happened 20-something years later, 
now for every single disease, we know not just a few variants, we actually know hundreds of variants, sometimes we even know thousands of genetic variants. There are, uh, there are therapies now based on this. Uh, you can't imagine today treating a cancer patient without sequencing, applying this technology to sequence their, uh, their tumor to understand what the uh, uh, genetic basis uh, of it is. Uh, so I think this, uh, this is, just shows that this type of technology has really uh, uh, took, took us a leap forward in, uh, in the field of medicine. But um, with all that greatness, genetics is just one component of our human health. Uh, genetics is also something that's fixed from birth. It doesn't change. So genetics does not take into account everything that happens to you in terms of your lifestyle and the environmental effect that, uh, that, uh, that uh, has on you. And of course, we know that these factors are, um, have a major impact. And we know that genetics by itself is not a destiny because you can overcome it with um, lifestyle and environmental factors. So for that reason, uh, over the past several years, people have started to look into uh, many additional layers of data, not just genetics, uh, because we have uh, uh, many other things that we can measure. For example, uh, we know and we learned that uh, we have a lot of bacteria within our body, what is called the microbiome, and people have been beginning to uh, measure the set of bacteria that we have within us. Uh, we have the activity of the genes, so uh, if you look at the not just the DNA of the genes, but, but how active they are in different uh, parts of, of the body. So that's a different technology. We, we have the immune system that tells us uh, what we've been infected by, uh, what we can be protected of. Um, and we have many, many other uh, layers of data. So, um, uh, but, but typically, uh, these layers of data have been, like the human genome, studied in isolation. So typically, you have a researcher focusing on one of these RNA sequencing, or the immune system, or the microbiome, but not integrating all of these data and pieces uh, together into a full story. And so uh, we asked what would happen if we took all of these different omic layers and we put them together and measured all of them on the same person, but not just on one person, but did that on many people. And uh, I believe that if we do that, then uh, because if you think about disease, every clinical symptom of disease, uh, much before that, uh, most likely there will be some, um, some observation of it at some molecular level. So if we did all of the type, type of measurements and we measured many different molecular levels, we would be able to see that people are on the trajectory to developing disease much before they develop it. So if we can do that, we'll be able to predict disease ahead of time. Uh, once we study these factors, we'll also be able to understand which of them are a result and which of them may be causative. So we might be able to intervene and even uh, prevent uh, these diseases. Of course, if we do these measurements on people, then um, uh, we, uh, we can develop personalized treatments. Uh, this can have many different applications also to uh, just the area of, uh, of, of wellness. And you know, um, drug development has really become a major problem now uh, in the world because every new drug takes uh, between one and sometimes even two decades to bring to the market. It costs billions of dollars and, and it's really, if you look at this uh, process, we have very few uh, new drugs that have been developed. So, so, this, uh, so this really needs to be changed. And I think with this type of data, we can also identify uh, novel uh, markers that will allow us to, in a data-driven fashion, develop drugs in a different way much more, um, in a much more timely fashion and much more uh, uh, cost benefit. So for all of these reasons, we initiated what we call not the human genome project, but now the human phenotype project, which like Eric said, is about measuring the totality of everything that could be measured uh, about people. And I'll show you uh, in a moment what we actually measure. And uh, the idea is that if we generate a much larger and much more diverse measurement of, of phenotypes that can uh, give rise to all of these different uh, applications. And so the way we think about it is, is kind of in these three different uh, layers of data. Uh, so uh, at the core is, is the data. We actually call this uh, a library because a library represents not just data, but really knowledge. So we call this a library. Around that, we have the, data, the layer that gives us the platform. So this gives us the, the, the access and the management uh, uh, to the data. And then on top of that, once you have the access and the ability to operate on the data, you can build many different 
applications, and I'll show you a few that we have been developing over the years, but, but this is just the tip of the iceberg, and, and there is much, much more that one uh, could do with this data. And, and I believe that implementing this type of approach could really bring us to the next frontier, the next generation of uh, precision medicine. So, so this is not just an idea. This is actually something that we've been uh, working on and executing in my lab for the past four or five years. This is an active project. Um, by now, our cohort is not the biggest cohort in the world, but I believe it is the cohort that is most broadly, most deeply uh, characterized uh, with all these layers of the library platform and applications. And uh, so far, we've, uh, at the Weizmann Institute, recruited over 8,000 people. We follow them uh, longitudinally over time. So every two years, people physically come in uh, to get retested. And so uh, we have over 8,000 people, over 28,000 uh, human years that we uh, have been following. And, and we developed everything uh, in the lab from the ability to recruit the patients to the ability to bring them into a clinic to uh, profile them uh, very rapidly to then taking the, the biological samples and, and applying and doing all the multiomic testing and of course then to doing the uh, data analysis which is the core expertise of, of, of my group. So we do, uh, we do what we call a full stack because, because we, um, we do all of these different uh, uh, layers. So I think that by implementing something like this, obviously it'll have many uh, medical applications, many pharmaceutical applications, but this data is so broad when you measure it on people that it'll also have, I believe, educational applications and even uh, social uh, applications. So uh, let me tell you now uh, what we actually measure about people. What, what is this human phenotype uh, that, uh, that we are uh, uh, talking about? Uh, and that's, of course, the, the, the core, really, the data, or, or what we call uh, the library. So, um, so every uh, patient or every subject that joins the study undergoes all of these different tests that I want to walk you through them. They're divided into three main areas. One area on your right are the clinical and physiological testing that we do to people. Uh, then on the upper left are the molecular tests. And then at the bottom left are the biobanking of samples that we do, which are very important because we can biobank samples that later on, sometimes in the future, where when new technologies and new assays are available, we can go back to the freezer, take out these samples, and apply new measurements to them, okay? or when costs go down for some of these. So, uh, so what are we doing uh, on the clinical and physiological side? Uh, we are uh, actually uh, analyzing many, many different systems of the body. So when people come in, we have all of their uh, historical medical records, all of their historical blood tests. Uh, we use an ultrasound machine to look at fat in the liver. Fatty liver is now a very major issue. It affects about 30% of the adult population in, in the United States. Uh, we use the ultrasound to also look at the carotids to, uh, um, to analyze uh, cardiovascular uh, health. We use a DEXA machine, which uh, looks at full body composition. So it tells you distribution of fat throughout the body. It also looks at bone density uh, throughout the body. Uh, to characterize the cardiovascular system, we use uh, EKG and uh, ABI. Uh, we take high-resolution images of the retina because there you can see blood vessels that also tell you a lot about uh, cardiovascular health. Uh, we send people home with sensors. So we use uh, continuous glucose monitors, which are sensors that measure your glucose levels every 15 minutes for um, an entire two weeks. So you can really look at the metabolism of people and get a health character, characterization of, of, of their nutrition. Uh, we use uh, sensors for sleep. Uh, these are at the grade of going to a sleeping lab, except you do that at home. And for three nights, you connect to these sensors that measure uh, saturation uh, in the blood. They measure your movements. We can look at really at sleep architecture. We can look at the phases of sleep that people uh, go through uh, throughout the night. And, uh, and, and, uh, and, and I believe that nobody has done these measurements of sleep on so many people, especially not when they're connected to all of these different other layers of data that, uh, that we have. Uh, we also collect uh, all of the information about the medication of people. People log in uh, all of their uh, dietary data. They fill out very extensive questionnaires, hundreds of questionnaires that tell us about their medical history, their uh, family background, their um, uh, even social economical status, their uh, lifestyle, uh, physical activities. 
and, and we have all of their uh, current and past uh, diagnoses. So, so this is on the physiological uh, and clinical characterization. Then in terms of molecular data, I believe that we are now measuring all of the molecular data that can be done at a high throughput and relatively reasonable cost. And this includes doing full genetic sequencing of people, looking at uh, the microbiome, both the oral microbiome and the gut microbiome, so the collection of the entire set of bacteria that, uh, that people have. Uh, we are using uh, mass spectrometry, so a device that can separate uh, compounds according to their masses. And we, from the blood, we can look at tens of thousands of different molecules in the blood. So cholesterol, for example, is, is one famous molecule, but we look at tens of thousands of such molecules uh, in the blood. Uh, from the blood, we do proteomics, so we can look at the collection of proteins, human proteins that uh, circulate uh, in our bloodstream. Uh, we developed a novel assay for the immune system, uh, whereby we synthesize hundreds of thousands of different antigens. And uh, we can, in a single experiment, take blood of a person and identify what antibodies that person has against all of the different antigens that we have. So uh, in other words, uh, in one experiment, we can tell the entire infectious history of a person. Okay, so obviously, People who were infected by COVID, we can tell that, but COVID is just one virus. We could basically tell all of the viruses that somebody has been infected with throughout their life, at least those for which they currently have uh, immune memory for. Uh, and finally, we also look at RNA sequencing, which looks at the uh, activity of the genes uh, in, in blood cells. And, and then we do biobanking, so we, we biobank live cells from people. So later on, we can, we can uh, thaw them, and we can do functional assays on them. Uh, we also uh, biobank uh, just blood uh, and, and urine, so, so many different additional assays could be done in the future. So what I mentioned before, that we profiled 8,000 people with some already coming for a second visit after two years, all of this data we have on all of the uh, participants that uh, joined the study so far. And, and as I mentioned in the last part of the talk, what I'd like to propose is, is, is for us to collaborate to establish uh, such a cohort here uh, in the UAE. So uh, in addition to uh, the cohort, which uh, starts mainly as a healthy cohort, we also work with clinicians to already profile people who have been diagnosed with some disease from the oncology space, cardiovascular space, uh, atopic dermatitis, uh, fatty liver disease. Uh, because that also allows us to immediately compare people who have a disease to healthy people. And because we have such a big healthy cohort, we can also easily find matched healthy controls for diseased people. And by that, uh, for free, uh, without recruiting separately every time a healthy matched control for a disease cohort, we can analyze very robustly uh, people who have disease against their matched healthy counterparts and find biomarkers of disease. I'll, I'll show you examples of this uh, in a few moments. So, so this is a busy slide. Uh, I won't go into all the details, but uh, this is just to show that even when you look at a healthy cohort, these are people between the age of 40 and 70 that we recruit. Uh, people between the age of 40 and 70, I mean, nobody is in obviously perfect health. People have various different conditions. And uh, when, uh, when you look at this data, uh, we see that uh, people take many, many different medications. People have many different abnormalities in, uh, in, their, um, in their blood tests. So there's really, the point I want to make here is that there is a lot of variation in people who are healthy that one could immediately uh, study when, when you collect this, uh, this type of data. So, uh, so I told you about the, the data, the library. That's the core of what, what we collect here. Then on top of that, we develop a, a platform, a computational platform, AI platform, that allows us to, to access the data. This performs all of the data cleanups and uh, outlier detection and modeling of uh, every uh, piece of data. You, you can see that the data here is very heterogeneous. And, um, and I think that there will be a lot of demand for this type of data. And, and the reason I think that is if you look at a uh, very complementary project to this, uh, the project, uh, what's called the UK Biobank, I think this is by far the, um, the most impressive uh, similar project that uh, has been going on. This is a project that uh, followed, uh, is still following half a million people from the UK, uh, by now over 15, uh, 15 years. 
Um, the data doesn't go as deep as we do in terms of the multi-omics, but, but it provides a lot of other uh, types of measurements. And if you look at uh, people who are accessing this data, there's tens of thousands of researchers, um, you know, um, uh, uh, over 2,000 uh, papers that were published and uh, many citations. This has really become a, a hub that many researchers are looking into and studying. So I believe that by building the next generation of data, not the data set that was designed uh, you know, 15 years ago with not so much omics, but really putting all of the molecular data together, I believe that there will be a really great demand for this type of data because of all the different uh, uses uh, it can have. So, um, so I now uh, basically wanna, uh, 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 this was kind of the very, uh, big vision and, and, and what, uh, um, what we actually are measuring on people. And, and I now want to be a little bit more concrete and tell you about some of the discoveries that, uh, that we've been making across uh, different areas by using this data. And I will mention that really this is just the tip of the iceberg. This is what we've been able to do just in my group. And I think when we, um, uh, as we uh, measure more and more people across more countries and open the data to many, many more researchers, uh, many more applications and discoveries uh, will be made. So, so the first area I want to tell you about is uh, therapeutics that uh, we are now developing, and, and this is actually uh, in the area of, of uh, gut bacteria. So, so as you know, the whole field of microbiome is, is a relatively new field, maybe 15 years old, uh, when we uh, were able finally with sequencing technology, uh, able to look at the collection of bacteria that we carry within our body uh, we have uh, the number of cells, uh, human cells that we have in our body equals the number of bacteria that uh, we have uh, in our body. The bacteria are just smaller, so in mass they are uh, uh, small, much smaller, but in terms of uh, diversity, they are actually much more diverse. Our human genome has about 25,000 genes. Our gut bacteria have millions of genes, most of which we actually don't even know yet what they do, but we know that these bacteria produce many, many different molecules. These molecules reach circulation in our blood. They can reach circulation in our brain. So they could be relevant for um, neurological disease, for metabolic disease, basically for every activity in our body. And, and the bacteria were here much before humans uh, were here, and uh, they will be uh, uh, after humans probably. And, and we always co-evolved with our bacteria. So our bacteria are really an integral part uh, of our health. Um, so uh, what we are doing is of uh, gut bacteria is, is going to be much, much faster than developing uh, a new synthetic compound because we isolate these bacteria from healthy people. So uh, in terms of safety, we already know that it's safe and we can go sometimes directly into human clinical trials. So in what I'll show you now, I believe that within two years already we'll go into uh, clinical trials in human to, uh, to test this. Uh, and so we have uh, two uh, uh, therapeutic developments that we're developing right now, both for diabetes and for, uh, for weight loss. And the idea is the following. Uh, when we take people and we measure their gut bacteria, we perform sequencing and we uh, get these short reads that we can then go and map onto reference genomes. And once we do this mapping, uh, we can record the genetic variation that we see at every position in every bacteria, and we can search for associations between this genetic div uh, diversity, genetic variation, and a human phenotype. So, for example, if you look at BMI, you can see this is, of course, just an illustration of three people. We do this on the thousands of people that we have. But in this illustration, you can see that the position that I marked there, the first individual has an A at that position. That person's BMI is 31, which is higher than the BMI of 25 and 26 that the two participants that have a T at that position have. So if we identify such positions that segregate basically high versus low BMI, then we've identified genetic variation that at least associates with the phenotype uh, of interest. So, so we develop such, such a framework, but, but we apply it to thousands of uh, samples that we have. And when we do that, we actually find many, many different uh, signals so what you're seeing here is uh, if somebody uh, has been working in the field of genetics, this is called a Manhattan plot. So typically in, in human genetics, the x-axis here would be human chromosomes, and every position would be a position in the human genome 
where variation uh, actually has a correlation with uh, the trait of interest, in this case BMI. The y-axis is the significance of the association, so, so the p-value, except that this is not the human genome, this is for gut bacteria. So the x-axis here now represents different bacteria where we found that genetic variation across positions is highly associated, in this case, with BMI. And, and the p-values here, the significance is, is very strong. But it's not just the significance, but it's really the, the size of the effect that is what impressed us the most. So if you look at uh, the same data, every uh, dot here represents a position in one bacteria where this variation is associated with the trait. But now the x-axis is the number of points of BMI that this variation explains. So you can see that we have here some genetic variants in bacteria that explain one or two points of BMI, which is a lot. One point of BMI or two points can be five or 10 kilograms of body weight, so, so that's huge. And, and these effects are actually much bigger than the effects that have been seen with human genetics. So the gut bacteria effects are much bigger, um, and this is why we believe it's exciting. And, and here's an example of one bacteria that we found, and if you focus here at the center, you can see that uh, we found one bacteria that has two genetic variants, let's call them the blue and the green genetic variants, where people who have the blue variant have a BMI of 24, and people who have the green variant have a BMI of 26, so two-point difference, which is huge on average, and, and the only uh, way we separate the, the groups is just by who has the blue genetic variant and who has the green genetic variant. And that already explains two points of BMI, so, so it's an interesting association with a very strong effect size. But when we look what happens to these people two years later, that becomes even more interesting because we see that people who had the blue variant, if you look at, at their change in BMI, they don't change, they maintain their weight. But people who had the green variant, they, they gain another one point of BMI, potentially another five kilograms of body weight over two years. So here's one bacteria that associates with uh, a lower BMI and uh, whose presence uh, predicts future uh, weight gain. So, so this is an example of a bacteria that we now want to go to the people who have the genetic variant in blue, isolate that bacteria, and add that to a formulation that we will give people, for example, who have a high BMI, and see if that can uh, help with weight loss. Okay, so that, those are the experiments we're, we're gearing uh, towards. And this is another example. We don't have just one of these bacteria. We have dozens of these bacteria that we identify that have these uh, difference in, in BMI and also uh, future, uh, future differences. So, um, so, so this is one thing that we're doing with, with these bacteria. Another thing is uh, we're, we're looking not just at human traits, but we're looking at uh, other bacteria. So uh, as you know, all of the antibiotics were originally uh, uh, developed by bacteria naturally to uh, fight other bacteria. So because we have the bacteria uh, of people, we can identify variants of bacteria that not only affect human traits, but also bacteria that affect other bacteria, and by that potentially identify also uh, novel uh, antibiotics, and we are finding many uh, such uh, signals as well. And, and I wanted to show you now uh, one project which we recently published where actually we've been uh, intervening, really changing the microbiome of people in one disease, in, in a, a, a skin disease, atopic dermatitis, uh, with, I think, very impressive clinical results to show you that by affecting and changing the gut bacteria, we can really uh, potentially develop new therapies. So, so atopic dermatitis is a disease of the skin. It's uh, very prevalent. It's actually in 20% of children and 10% of adults, uh, and, and people suffer from it uh, quite a lot. Uh, and so what we did was uh, to do a, what's called a fecal microbiome transplant, where we take uh, fecal material of a healthy donor, uh, which has gut bacteria from that donor, and we transplant that into uh, patients of, in this case, atopic dermatitis, and we uh, check to see uh, the effects. So when we did this, and, and this paper was, was just published, uh, I hope you can see this is a uh, atopic dermatitis AD patient where uh, the clinical manifestation of disease are very, prev uh, very uh, um, uh, 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 obvious. Uh, you can see them because it's a disease of the skin. And after we gave uh, this patient the FMT, the um, 
microbiome material from a healthy donor, we actually saw clearance of uh, the clinical symptoms in this patient just after two dosings of FMT. And, and here's another patient where, again, you can see the manifestation of disease, and, and those were cleared after we were giving this, uh, this FMT. So uh, we wanted to, uh, first we, we, we kind of scored, th this was a proof of principle study. We only did this on nine patients, but 100% of them responded. The average improvement was 70% in clinical symptoms, and we are now doing this study on a larger set to hopefully identify and pinpoint the exact bacteria and isolate them and maybe develop a new therapy for atopic dermatitis. And when we looked what happened under the hood, uh, we analyzed uh, the bacteria. We saw what happens at, uh, at baseline. So before there's even a connection between the donor uh, and the patient, uh, we can look at many different bacteria. So the y-axis here, every row is a different bacteria. And uh, these, uh, these box plots here, the, the gray box plots, show the genetic distance between the genome of this bacteria and people who are not related. Okay, so uh, when you look at the same species of bacteria, the genome is identical by about 99%, sometimes even more, which means that on millions of base pairs, there would be tens of thousands of differences, but it'll be 99% identical. And this is between unrelated individuals. And, and the dots here represent the distances between the donor and the patient. But this is at baseline, before we actually did the FMT. So before you do the FMT, you don't expect that there's a relationship between the donor and the patient. They should be as far away apart as unrelated individuals, which they are. You can see that the dots are right where the uh, box plots are, so uh, there's distance between the donor and the patient. After we give placebo capsules, so, so this experiment, we first gave placebo to people, so capsules without any gut bacteria from the donor. You see that the dots are in the same place. But after we do, the app really change. But once we give uh, uh, this green patient a uh, sample, or we do the, uh, the transplant from the green donor, we see that there's a major shift in his microbiome, and he becomes not identical, but very similar to his donor. So this really happened with, um, with, with, with essentially all of the uh, different patients here, uh, this FMT uh, really shifted their microbiome, and I showed you before that uh, we saw an, an improvement in clinical symptoms, so we think that it's really the change in the bacteria that caused this, and as I mentioned, we're now doing larger studies to try and develop therapies for AD based on, uh, based on gut bacteria. Um, so, so that's one area of therapeutics that, that we are developing, the area of, of, uh, of the microbiome. Uh, I want to uh, now tell you about some um, uh, uh, other cohorts that we've been analyzing uh, with the purpose of trying to find biomarkers, uh, novel biomarkers uh, for disease. Uh, here, the idea behind a lot of what we do is that we use the very large cohort of thousands of people to shed light on much smaller cohorts of certain diseases where, uh, say, we take uh, 100 patients of multiple sclerosis, and we can then identify from our healthy cohort a matched control for these 100 patients. Sometimes and oftentimes, we'll actually be able to match 10 healthy patients for each one uh, disease patient. So that'll give us readily a very robust uh, analysis based on many, many uh, more people, allowing us to m then identify much more robust uh, biomarkers for disease. So uh, we've been doing that uh, in multiple areas, uh, using many different, uh, um, many different layers of, of data. Uh, and I think one of the most um, interesting layers of data that we've been measuring is what's called metabolomics. So this is the set of small molecules, metabolites, that we can measure in the blood that we can separate, as I mentioned before, according to, to their mass. And this has been just one of the most informative uh, data sets uh, that we have. Uh, so, um, so ideally, we, we, we know that uh, all of the molecules that circulate in our bloodstream, they have a huge impact on, on our health. Uh, and so we really want to identify what are the drivers of each of these different molecules. So, you know, take cholesterol, for example. We know that cholesterol can cause heart disease. Of course, we'd like to know, therefore, uh, what determines levels of cholesterol, because if we, if we knew that, and for cholesterol we know it, we could then develop drugs that alter these uh, factors that control cholesterol, and by that, 
uh, maybe change and, and treat uh, disease. So we really want to identify the, the driving uh, forces behind it because, because then we could, we could intervene. So uh, when you have such a large cohort of people where you've really measured all of the metabolites and you measured genetics and diet and microbiome and all of the other, these other things that I mentioned, you could really, for each metabolite, you can study what are the driving forces of it. And, and we published a paper in Nature a couple of years ago where, where we identified many different drivers of many different metabolites. So um, some metabolites, some of the molecules in, in our blood we, we identified are actually synthesized and driven by gut bacteria. So if that molecule became, ever became important for disease, the way to change that would be to change your gut bacteria. Uh, but then other molecules we identified are actually driven by diet, by what you eat. Many molecules are driven by what you eat. You know, uh, um, uh, uh, just a positive control and a simple uh, example is, is caffeine. So we found that uh, you know, caffeine is driven by uh, whether if you drink coffee, you'll have caffeine in your blood. That's an obvious uh, one, but uh, so, so many molecules are driven uh, by diet. And, and some molecules are driven uh, genetically. So genetic variants between people explain a large deal of the changes in, in metabolites. So, so when we are, um, oh, and, and we also uh, independently validated these, so uh, we collaborated with a group in the UK. Um, we uh, basically got from them just the gut bacteria information from people. We used the models that we developed on the Israeli cohort uh, to predict metabolite levels in the cohort from the UK. We sent back uh, the predictions. We never saw the metabolomics data, and, and all of the top 50 metabolites that we predicted on, on the Israeli cohort replicated uh, in the UK cohort. So when you have a lot of data, you can really build robust models that identify signals that, that are true that you can independently then validate in uh, international cohorts. Uh, we also showed that some of these associations that we find are really causal. So uh, we went, uh, for example, with a sourdough bread. We saw that uh, we identified some metabolites that um, sourdough bread consumption affects. We did an intervention. We gave people for one week uh, sourdough bread, and uh, we indeed saw that um, metabolites that we predicted would be changed by consumption of sourdough bread. Indeed, they, uh, they increased. And the same did not happen when we gave white bread to uh, the same participants. So in other words, this shows you that sometimes these associations that we find are, are really causal, meaning that we really identified the factors that are driving these metabolites. So we would know how to intervene in order to change the levels of uh, blood molecules in people. So, so equipped with this information, we can really shed light on uh, cohorts of disease. And, and one that uh, we just recently published in Nature Medicine is on people with uh, acute coronary syndrome, so people who underwent a heart attack. And here we developed uh, um, kind of, I think, a new approach to personalized medicine where uh, we can analyze even just a single patient. So if you have a single patient, let's say a 60-year-old male who had a heart attack, you can go into the healthy cohort, identify in that healthy cohort also 60-year-old males but, but who did not undergo a heart, a heart attack, so who are healthy. And we can then compare the different layers of data of the patient to the healthy cohort. And we can do that, for example, on these uh, metabolites, on, on the small molecules uh, in the blood. Uh, and then uh, we can build the distribution of each metabolite what levels it should have according to the personalized reference cohort for this person because these are his own matched uh, controls. And we can see where our individual lies and, and how far he is away from the expected distribution. We can do that for all of the uh, metabolites that, uh, that we measure. And by that, we can identify all of the deviations in metabolites that, um, that we see uh, in this patient. And once we identify all of these deviations, we can go back to what I just presented to you and, and the, I, the driving factors behind these, these different metabolites and know whether uh, for this patient, his meta metabolite deviations are driven mostly by dietary factors or by the gut bacteria or by lifestyle factors or by genetics. So we can understand the metabolite deviations in a single person. What are the underlying reasons for, for that? And, and when we do that, we see that even though we sometimes have two people, say two 60-year-old males, that both had a heart attack, 
they had a heart attack most likely for different reasons. Because uh, even though they reached the same clinical endpoint, you look at their deviations in blood molecules, and in one person, these deviations are driven by gut bacteria. In another, their deviation is driven by genetics. In another, their deviation is driven by diet. And therefore, the treatment should probably uh, be different for these different people. And, and this is, I think, the essence of uh, personalized medicine and how all of these different layers of data can guide you uh, in that direction. And we know that this is a major problem because we know that most of the therapies that we give for a condition, they only work in 20, 30 percent of people. And, and I think this is the reason because sometimes they're targeting uh, the reason, uh, the underlying cause in, in, in a subset of the people, but that is not the cause in another subset of people. And this data is a proof of that. So I think once you develop this data, you could really stratify people, patients, into the type of treatment that uh, they should get. And, and this could really lead us to uh, the next era of uh, personalized medicine. Uh, here's another example from uh, uh, multiple scler sclerosis uh, disease, where we identified one pathway, uh, which actually eventually produces a compound called uh, indolactat. Uh, indolactat uh, is actually known to protect neurons from uh, oxidative damage. Uh, multiple sclerosis is a, is a neurodegenerative uh, disease. And, and here we identified that along this pathway, when we measured the blood of people, then patients compared to healthy controlled had lower levels of this compound that gives protection to neurons. And not only did they have lower levels of this compound, but also the gut bacteria that synthesize one of these uh, pathways were also lower uh, in the patients. So together, this suggests that perhaps this is one pathway that if we intervene and we uh, increase it in, in patients, maybe uh, that can also be therapeutic for, uh, in this case, multiple sclerosis. So just a demonstration of how multiple layers of data uh, can, can shed, uh, shed light here. Um, uh, in another area of uh, IBD, IBD is an inflammatory uh, bowel disease, also a very uh, serious disease that people uh, people suffer from a gastrointestinal tract disease. Um, there's, uh, there's a lot of inflammation that happens in this disease. And when we look at the microbiome, we see a very distinctive microbiome signature in IBD patients. We see that they actually have a lot of more uh, non-bacterial reads, human, uh, uh, human sequencing reads in their stool, in, in their fecal material. And this is most likely because people who have IBD, they have shedding of uh, more um, uh, epithelial cells, and those eventually uh, make it into many more human reads. So we ident identify the signature. They, these people actually have less richness of bacteria, so um, their bacterial population is it's much less uh, diverse. And we also identify specific bacteria that are different in IBD patients compared to healthy control. So, so perhaps also this microbiome signature uh, could also uh, help in uh, diagnosis and maybe even treatment of, of IBD. Um, and then the final uh, part I want to tell you is, is what we are doing in the space of oncology, of the space of cancer. Um, so here uh, we actually have several different programs that uh, you can see here on, are on various stages of development from uh, creating a collaboration with clinicians all, all the way to establishing uh, relation, working relationships, MTA, recruiting patients, and eventually uh, analyses. Um, and what I want to show you here is that uh, basically we, we collaborate with clinicians who treat uh, different oncology patients, for example, people with pancreatic cancer. And the power is that we can um, uh, profile these patients and then go back to our healthy cohort and match them with a much larger set of uh, healthy controls to do a very robust analysis. So for example, in, in pancreatic cancer, uh, when we develop these AI models that try to look only at gut bacteria and ask whether you can, uh, you can classify, you can predict, based on gut bacteria, who is a pancreatic cancer patient and who is healthy, uh, you can see that, that we can actually do a fairly good job. Uh, and I think we can do it because for about 100 patients or 86 patients, we can match close to 400 matched healthy controls, so we can do a very robust analysis, and we can identify specific bacteria that we can ask ourselves whether these also could be therapeutic for uh, pancreatic cancer. Uh, also for GI cancers, a similar story. Uh, we, can, we, can, we can identify robust 
uh, signatures. We see that cancer patients have uh, less diverse bacteria. They differ in specific bacteria, so maybe this can also be uh, an area for, uh, for therapeutics. Similar for, uh, also for, uh, for breast cancer. And, and for breast cancer, and, and this will be uh, my final uh, story here, uh, for breast cancer, we are also um, now doing a, a dietary intervention because in general, I believe that um, uh, diet is something that has been uh, much more overlooked and not really been integrated into medicine in general and definitely not into the treatment of cancer. And, and we've been starting to do this, um, I think, successfully in, in, uh, in breast cancer. And uh, we chose breast cancer because in breast cancer, actually 75% of the women are uh, what's called HR positive, hormone uh, receptor, receptor uh, positive, and then they receive very effective hormonal therapy, endocrine uh, therapy. But uh, that therapy actually has a major side effect. And the side effect is that over 50% of the women who use that hormonal therapy, they actually gain weight. They gain a lot of weight. That weight gain has health problems in itself, but it also causes a lot of the women to just stop the therapy. So, so this is a major problem with uh, breast cancer uh, uh, treatment, uh, which is why we thought that a dietary intervention here uh, could be, uh, could be uh, interesting. So, um, so the approach that, that we use is something that we've been working on in the lab. Actually, this is a project we started uh, 12 years ago on uh, just developing an um, uh, algorithmic approach to personalized nutrition. Uh, the way we approached it is by uh, these continuous glucose monitors, so to look with a data-driven approach at how people's blood sugar levels changes after they eat meals. And what we discovered in this uh, study, the first one we published some years ago, is that when you give people the same food, like here, four different people eating bread, you can see that uh, in the same color, the same person eats the same four slices of bread on different mornings. They, that person has very similar responses, but different people have very different responses. So in other words, the response to a meal is, is very personalized. So if you want to balance blood sugar levels, which we know is very key to uh, weight management, to diabetes, to many other diseases, then, then you have to tell uh, this person in blue that they can eat bread, but this person in brown at the top that they uh, should probably avoid uh, eating bread. So you really have to personalize uh, the approach. And, and, and so um, in that project that we published seven years ago, we recruited 1,000 people. We, measured responses to 50,000 different meals, and we developed an algorithm that took personal information, gut bacteria information, and clinical parameters to make these uh, predictions of, personalized predictions of meals, uh, from which we could then design dietary interventions where we took people who, on their regular diet, you see they have many spikes in glucose levels. And when we use the algorithm to tailor a diet for the same person, with exactly the same amount of calories, we can uh, fully normalize the blood glucose levels of these people. So, so this we published seven years ago, uh, and then just last year, uh, we published a um, real randomized clinical trial where uh, we actually gave people who have prediabetes, um, we gave them, we randomized 100 people to a standard of care Mediterranean diet, and 100 people to uh, the algorithm diet, and, and we saw that we can take people who are pre-diabetic, you can see at the top, one month of glucose profiling, they have many spikes in glucose levels, and when we give them the algorithm diet, we, we for now half a year, fully balance their uh, blood sugar levels. And, and when we looked at uh, the parameter that people look at in diabetes, hemoglobin A1C, we saw that uh, we actually reached a very significant effect. So after six months of intervention, the standard of care diet, um, which is in red, achieved some effect, but that effect was lost when we followed up on people one year later. Whereas in the um, algorithm diet in green, we saw double the effect after six months, which actually persisted in the next six months of follow-up. So, so this whole dietary uh, approach is, uh, is, 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 is one that we showed uh, could actually successfully balance and help uh, people with diabetes. We, um, seven years ago, we also launched uh, a company uh, off of this. It's called uh, Day2. Uh, this uh, 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 technology has been adopted by the major HMOs uh, uh, in Israel. It's been uh, treating uh, so far 100,000 people in Israel and now also 
uh, in the US and for people with diabetes um, and people um, uh, with, uh, to, to, in term, with high, high weight, this, uh, this technology has really uh, proven itself. So we uh, have also now been applying it in the area of uh, breast cancer. And here too, we are doing a randomized clinical trial. Um, over 100 uh, women with breast cancer patients have been recruited. This study is still ongoing, but not only do we not see uh, weight gain, but we actually see weight loss uh, we actually see weight loss, uh, in this case, being similar between the standard of care diet and the uh, algorithm diet. But in terms of the glucose levels, we are seeing a more significant improvement in the algorithm diet compared to uh, the standard of care diet. So, so we think we are now also helping in the area of breast cancer with these uh, dietary uh, interventions. So, uh, so that's been the main part of the, um, of, of the, the scientific part that, that I wanted to impress on you to uh, show you the many different applications. And really, this is just the tip of the iceberg, what we were able to study uh, just in a, single, uh, in a single lab. I think that once this type of data is expanded, uh, much more can be done with it when many more researchers uh, 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 um, uh, study this data. And so we really are now in the process of trying to go not just from 10,000 people, but really to grow on many different axes, to grow in terms of the number of people, to grow in the terms of the um, assays that we do. So even though we do very deep profiling of people, there are more assays that can be done, so we'd like to expand that axis as well. We'd like to move into uh, different countries, uh, so we'd like to look at uh, many more ethnicities, and I think the combination of studying that uh, together can give uh, uh, rise to many, many, many more discoveries. And I mentioned some disease areas that we work on. Obviously, we haven't come close to cover the entire space, so we'd like to also cover additional uh, disease areas. Uh, and so uh, in my lab, um, uh, we, we've developed all of these abilities, uh, uh, basically all the way from building the cohort uh, to, um, to a clinic, uh, to performing the test, uh, some of them are proprietary and all the way to, uh, to analyzing the data. And, and so coming to uh, the last uh, short segment of, uh, of the talk is, is basically um, the proposal that uh, I would like to, uh, to give to this crowd here, and, and hopefully uh, that'll be the basis of initiating discussions that could lead to a collaboration, is to basically think about the idea of establishing a similar cohort to uh, the one that we established to establish such, uh, such a cohort uh, in, in the UAE. Um, and so we call this, um, uh, we, we realized at some point that you know, we've been working for many years on uh, this technologies for, uh, for all the different aspects of uh, you know, going from the um, uh, recruiting patients to uh, putting together the clinics to having standard operating uh, protocols to knowing how to, how, to, how to market this to the general public, how to engage the general public such that they'll be interested in joining, such that they will get meaningful reports back so that they'll keep engaged and they'll keep uh, coming back, uh, to uh, how do you set up the clinics to all the different stations, what equipment do you need, how do you profile people, how do you do it in a, in a short time in an efficient and costly uh, effective manner. So we've been developing uh, all of these, and what we'd like to do is to bring these technologies to, to additional geographies like, like the UAE and establish uh, such a cohort so it includes uh, all of the setup of the cohort, then uh, the labs, all of the multi-omics we, uh, we actually are doing at very high throughput with robotics. So potentially samples could be collected here and then shipped centrally to uh, our lab in Israel for processing or in the uh, longer uh, future, uh, uh, also establish uh, similar omic technologies here, and maybe some of them uh, already exist. Um, and then uh, uh, all of the technology to really manage participants, which also is, is, is a major uh, big deal. And then the, uh, the system that actually provides access to the data, but not just to the data collected here, also to uh, the uh, data that we have globally on the Human Phenotype Project, which currently uh, is available in Israel, but we are already in advanced discussions with, with at least two additional countries to establish uh, such cohorts uh, uh, over there. And I think the power of analyzing all of these data together is, uh, is going to be uh, very strong. 
So uh, basically, at the Weizmann, uh, we have the technology to know how to do all of this from cohort design, all of the technologies, knowing how to do the operations, the labs, uh, the data access. And uh, we'd like to, to propose that here, uh, with local funding uh, at the UAE, we can uh, perform the uh, participant recruitment, uh, use the data access and technologies that we developed in Weizmann, and really establish a collaboration whereby we would generate this data and analyze it uh, both here and in Israel and jointly uh, together with all of uh, the data. And, and I won't go into the details of this, but we actually have very uh, detailed protocols for how to do this. And I think once we uh, start, within six months, we could be at the phase where we start to really dry run this. And uh, maybe after six or nine months, we could really begin to recruit the first patient and then uh, begin to establish the court. So because of all of the years of work that uh, we've been uh, putting into this and all the technologies that we have, uh, I believe that in a very short period of time, one can establish such cohorts in, uh, in other places. And I really believe that all of this together could really lead us uh, to uh, really build the next generation of uh, precision medicine. And with that, I will uh, end, just put the acknowledgement slide of all the great uh, uh, students and postdocs in my lab that have been building this and, and be happy to take any questions. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Fatma Jasme from so I'm a biochemical geneticist. I have multiple questions for you. Impressive work, actually. One of the questions is your healthy cohort. So the phenotyping of those ones, what is your inclusion criteria to make sure that those are truly healthy cohort, especially that I have seen afterwards a list of lots of medication was taken by those healthy cohorts? Yeah, that, that's, a, that's an excellent question because um, you know, I think it's, uh, we found it very hard to define what, what a healthy person is, say, in the age of 40 to 70. So the way we do it is actually by exclusion criteria. Okay, so, so we take a number of uh, you know, very uh, more severe and active disease, and if you have those, then, then you're excluded from the trial. And, and if you pass and you don't have all the exclusion criteria, then, then you're, you're included. So, so that's why, uh, you know, um, for example, take BMI. BMI is, you know, high BMI is, is currently by itself not a disease, so we would have a range of BMI within the quote-unquote healthy cohort, of course, within that cohort, because you have so much variation in, in blood tests and BMI and, and other markers, th that's why I think a healthy cohort is actually very interesting because there is, I think, no such thing as uh, you know, perfectly healthy people at the age of you know, 40 to 70. And people vary by all of these different dimensions, giving us a very rich data set that, uh, that we can study even in, in what's called a, a, a healthy cohort. So basically, you take it from, uh, from your, based on your studied population, basically, and then compare to the excluded from the health cohort that you have. Right. So, so, so we, have, you know, we have a website. People register, and then they have to say that uh, you, you're asked uh, a series of questions, like, do you have active cancer, active IBD, active diabetes? And, and if you answer yes to one of those, then you're excluded. Otherwise, you can, you can participate in the study. So that's how. So it's kind of a definition of healthy by exclusion. And then you do the whole, the, the physiological workup. I was interested, actually, one of the physiological that you mentioned, and especially that you have a cohort of cardiovascular, echo was not part of it, even though you do the ultrasound of liver and you do the AKG, but you know the echo is very. Yes, like I mentioned, there are obviously there are, you know, even though I think, as far as I know, this is the most deeply phenotyped cohort, obviously we don't do all of the tests that can be done, uh, um, um, you know, today. And uh, part of them, we are actually adding more and more tests. But it's always a balance between also for how, how long do you bring a person, how much um, time and how much money do you spend on profiling uh, you, you know, a single person versus uh, uh, you know, making the process uh, easy. Um, one of the other things we're, we're thinking about um, is, is, uh, is also to profile a subset of people for certain things. So if you identify that people have a, um, a high risk for uh, some disease, then maybe a, a more deep test for that disease you can only apply to those people. And this actually ties, ties into you know, an area in AI called active learning, where you kind of try to ask yourself uh, before you do a test, how much information is going, am I going to get by doing this additional test? 
And I think these, th this type of active learning can actually be used to really um, um, look at a much larger series of tests where for each person we would do a different uh, series of tests depending on what um, you know, the AI uh, tells us we would be the most informative test. And I think part of your phenotype physiological is also psychological because you know the stress by itself it's caused lots of, okay. The other part is, did you include the electronic medical charts basically and the data of those healthy with that cohort and compare it in your analysis or it was not? Yeah, yeah, so, so we actually have when participants on board our study, we, we, we basically import their, uh, their current medical records, yeah. So that was part of your that, that's part That's part of the assessment and data that we get. And people. basically your cohort of the disease is, it's open. It's whatever disease cohort that you are interested on. So it's sub, so yeah. you are expanding basically and you go by priority and with the interest of researchers, I believe, right? Yes. And you do the same set of what you have done on your healthy control to begin with. Yes, yes. So, so there we collaborate with clinicians who, you know, at the hospital treat some disease like type 1 diabetes or fatty liver disease. They have, they have a, they have patients that they are seeing, and then we establish a collaboration with them where we, uh, exactly as you say, we, we profile their cohort with a similar test that we do on the healthy cohort, and then that's how we can compare. And, and I showed you several examples of these uh, comparisons uh, for identifying novel uh, biomarkers. So one of the other things was about your microbiome. So you're looking into the gut, uh, like um, the mi microbiome, and you said about the BMI and your association with this variant. So yes, it was a strong association looking into your whole thing, but now as a geneticist, I'm looking into the causality basically and what's mechanism of action and how this can explain basically the response versus it. Do you have any explanation for that? Yeah, so, so that is the key question, of course, that uh, you know, when you look at the microbiome, which I consider to be an environmental factor, of course, it could be that the BMI is actually what affected the change in the bacteria. So, and then, and if that's the case, if you change the bacteria, you won't affect the BMI. But it could be that the bacteria are giving a propensity to uh, develop uh, weight gain or weight loss. And, and in that case, if you change the bacteria, it will actually have an effect. So, uh, ultimately, the only way to show that is by experiments, where you would really introduce new bacteria to people who are overweight and see if that affects their weight. So we have to do these uh, trials, and that's what we're gearing up towards. Before that, you can, uh, you, know, you can get suggestive evidence. Like, for example, if we see genetic variation in an enzyme that uh, breaks down sugar, then uh, we could predict that maybe uh, that variation actually allows one person to gain more energy from the same food compared to another person. Uh, if we see, for example, longitudinally that uh, people who have a certain bacteria actually, like I showed, gain more weight than others, then, then obviously it's not that gain of weight that uh, changed the bacteria. The bacteria was there before. So we could use such suggestive evidence to try and do causal inference, but ultimately causality will only be proven in a clinical trial. Thank you so much. Thanks very much. Um, that was a brilliant lecture. Thank, Thank you, you very much indeed. Thank you. Um, I just had two questions. Um, uh, the first one is that I've, I've spent a lot of time over the last 25 years working on Biobank. Indeed, I'm a subject of Biobank as well. Uh, Biobank, as you know, is 500,000 people of whom 100,000 have been imaged, and I've mostly been working on the imaging. Um, and the, although it was initially supposed to be a map of the entire healthy population of the UK, which, uh, you know, thank God I'm one, um, in fact, it turned out to be a really rather skewed distribution. Yes. And I just wonder whether or not, in fact, in the 10K people that you've built into your database so far, you've got that same, because it's essentially on a volunteer basis, whether or not you've effectively got, unwittingly, a very skewed population. Yeah, so, so, so the problem you're raising is when you kind of open up, uh, I think the UK is a, is a really good example where I know, for example, that uh, roughly 9% of the adult population is with diabetes, but uh, when 9 million people were sent an invitation to join the study and 500,000 people came, only 4% of them were, were diabetic. So it really is, a, is skewed and is skewed more towards healthy people who are maybe more conscious of their health and they come to volunteer for these studies. I think this is an inherent issue with uh, such cohorts. Uh, we also have uh, that, that issue. It's, it's skewed in that way. It's also skewed in, in ways of different minorities that participate less 
in our study, I think that's uh, the same uh, in, the, in the UK Biobank. I think that's an issue that we should uh, try and, uh, and overcome. Uh, we've, also, we've actually been recently engaging with uh, the Arab community heavily in Israel to try and engage them more in, uh, in, such, uh, in such a study. Uh, I, I think that's a challenge that we have to get better and better on. Um, but I would say that even uh, when, when your, your data is skewed, so maybe it's not representative of the population, um, but, but you still get to see so much variation that you can identify and extract all of these uh, biomarkers. But I agree that on this issue, uh, we should be improving. But all is not lost because, in fact, some of the work we've been doing on type 2 diabetes were people who started out in, in Biobank and some of whom right. developed type 2 diabetes yeah. and, and the others who were, in fact, uh, two, two, three controls per, per person. So yeah. I think that's fine. Actually, just moving on to that, and to my other, other question was, I was fascinated by your work on the, on the bacteria the, in the, the gut microbiome and on BMI. And the reason, the reason I'm interested in that, of course, is that people have looked at BMI as a correlate of type 2 diabetes. But actually, it turns out that if you look at BMI, it effectively confounds extracorporeal fat, right. sc skeletal muscle, yeah. and uh, visceral adipose tissue. And the real baddie is the visceral adipose tissue. And I would have been really fascinated to see those results that you showed if you specialized and marginalized out, so you just looked at the visceral adipose tissue. So uh, actually, I didn't, I didn't uh, show this here, but um, the models that we developed for BMI, because we have the DEXA that actually looks at the visceral fat, these models actually explain more, visceral, more of the visceral fat than they do of BMI, which is fascinating. I think they really capture, that's why uh, we're really excited about going into clinical trials with them, because I think, uh, we think they capture more uh, the real, the real um, you know, fat component that is key to health than, uh, than just the pecular some of the peculiarities of BMI itself. I can't resist saying that. I, I was delighted that you, uh, how you showed how the use of the process of food signifies my life threat. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Professor. Very impressive lecture. Thank you. One question regarding rear disease, because obviously I think it could be a game changer considering the cost, uh, finding the solution. But I am wondering, that considering that we have a very low number of patients, do you think that it can be applied or not? We need a big sample of patients on that area. Yeah, so, so regarding rare disease, obviously, um, uh, I, I think to be able to, I think the things that could be addressed most effectively with these type of courts are the most more common disease, you know, all the metabolic, which you know, really is, a, is, is an epidemic uh, worldwide uh, and has major uh, health problems and cardiovascular disease and more of the, common ones. I think for uh, rare disease, um, I, I, think the, I think what we need to do, and that's what we're aiming for, is to just expand this more and more to you know, more geographies, more people. And the more we do that, the more we will be able to look at um, diseases that are less and less uh, common. But I think at the moment, you know, for 10,000 people, rare disease is something that uh, is not the best cohort to study for. Thank you for your presentation. I'm impressed by the number of uh, participants you have in this cohort. So um, my question will be uh, related to uh, the longitudinal uh, potential of this cohort. 10,000 uh, participants uh, to be longitudinal. This is uh, very interesting. You didn't mention uh, at which pace are you collecting all of this type of omics. Uh, and related to, uh, to this question, how do you make sure that you have access to active participants? It, it takes a substantial effort from the participant size, side uh, to, to, to provide all of this uh, kind of testing. And, and probably, uh, ultimately, uh, how did you succeed in financing this type of huge cohort? Yeah. So, um, so first, uh, just the details. We, uh, at the moment, for our cohort, we uh, recruit them at baseline every one year there's a online follow, virtual follow-up to assess any changes in their health, any, any medical procedures they did, we, we get that information. And every two years, they physically come back and we do, we do all of this profiling, except for genetics, of course, which you don't need to do, to do twice. Uh, so so that's, that's what we are doing. Uh, I agree with you that it's a big challenge to, so 
people are consented actually for 25 years, we can recontact them, but it is a challenge to keep that community of participants engaged, and we actually invest a lot of efforts in that, which is, I, I, I think it's really a pillar, a key pillar of what, uh, what, we, are, uh, what we have been developing. Uh, and what we invest in is we invest in, in uh, community building, so to try and give just uh, insights uh, to people that would be of interest to them, to keep them engaged. Uh, for every test that people do, we give them a report. So for example, when we connect people to continuous glucose monitors, they immediately get back a report of what their glucose levels were in the two weeks that they were connected, so they know which foods that they ate spiked their glucose levels, which did not, so they immediately get insights into their own healthy nutrition. And, and for, you know, for sleep, we give them uh, their quality of sleep and, and various assessments and, and reports. So we invest a lot of that because, because we think it, it is uh, very important. Um, in terms of funding, so far, uh, the funding for this has been uh, academic grants and uh, philanthropy. Um, and uh, recently, we uh, launched a spin-off company uh, based on this which uh, hopefully uh, uh, in the future will also allow us to, to expand, this, uh, expand this more. And, and the other way to expand the data is, is by, uh, for example, trying, um, like uh, the goal here, maybe establish a parallel cohort in the UAE and other uh, countries. And, um, and I think that's a win-win that's because people in these other places would benefit from having local cohorts. And uh, together, this could be another way to uh, increase uh, to find funding ways to, to expand this uh, cohort globally. I think we have one more question here. Hi, th thanks a lot for your talk. Um, so you know, a lot of us who work with electronic health records understand that they suffer from a lot of noise, right? So that what, sorry? That electronic health records suffer from a lot of noise. You have practice differences, you have you know, practices like upcoding where hospital providers are trying to manipulate the claims by adding on more diagnosis codes and so on. You know, and give, given this, uh, what's your view on taking models that are developed in research studies with grand magnitudes such as yours and actually productionizing it in various parts of the world where, again, the practice of recording data in EHR is just so vastly different that any transferability experiments that have been done, for example, the JAMA study that looked at sepsis model um, you know, and how well it worked in prospective studies in the U.S., the PPVs were actually quite, quite low yeah. to the point of them being, you know, just, just basically an useless in yeah. actual clinical use. And so I just wanted to understand your view on how do you see these observations translating into uh, clinical use. Yeah, so I think you, you raise a, a good point on, on EHRs specifically, which are, um, you know, very different in different parts of the world, very, uh, very biased. Uh, I would even add that they don't contain all of these uh, molecular testing, so your ability to find novel biomarkers is very limited uh, within, uh, within such, uh, such data. And, and you know, EHR research is, uh, we are also, uh, have also been working on it uh, quite a lot. There's, uh, there's a lot of, uh, I mean, it's a very active area of research that tries to address exactly all the biases that you mentioned. I think that by a step, <coughs> sorry, by establishing a cohort where uh, you actually bring people and you do all of the same standardized measurements on all the people that you do, that you bring, uh, that's how you can overcome these biases because then you've really did, you've done a survey of all of the testing on uh, all the people, uh, I mean, similar to what they do in the UK Biobank, except, you know, in, in a more modern uh, era of uh, what we are doing here. So I think that's the way to overcome it. And, and, and I really believe that um, this type of data and cohort would be uh, much more valuable and insightful for that than, than uh, the EHRs, even though EHRs uh, have many more people. Yeah, thank you, Aran. This is a great talk. Um, I, I have uh, three questions, um, ranging from technical questions to more like a, a public kind of policy questions. So in UAE, you know, we know that uh, we have a very, very heterogeneous population. You know, it's made up about, about you know, many expats plus uh, the UAE nationals. Um, when you de deploy this kind of uh, sample collection process, 
you will obviously face a different demography you know, of uh, population distributions. Any advice on how to design the sampling process, you know, uh, or we just uh, go voluntary kind of uh, collection of uh, patients? Yeah, that, 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 that's a key question. And in, in the slide that I had of uh, starting this whole process, the first item is actually the study design. And that's where I think we would sit together to think, uh, you know, what, what are the key research questions the, that we'd like to answer? What are the key first goals that, that we'd like? Uh, you know, are we after specific disease? Are we after the most common disease here? Are we after uh, uh, more the local population, uh, which would be maybe more homogeneous than, than just a volunteer based on uh, everybody who's, who's available uh, here? So, so I think those are, those are key questions that I don't think there's a, uh, you know, just an immediate answer. And I think we would have to think about depending on uh, the study design. I could imagine, um, you know, I could imagine either focusing on a uh, more well-defined population, uh, which would allow us to look at maybe, a, a, you know, more homogeneous population and, and more uh, tailored focused question. And I could also imagine that, you know, we care about uh, just some representation of everybody who's here, and then you open it to uh, everybody to volunteer. So I think those are those are key things that uh, one would think of deeply through in the start initiation of this. Right, right. In, in our own, you know, UAE genome project, I believe we are facing the same type of questions. That's why we invited a lot of the decision makers here to okay. to, to join the discussion. Uh, following up on that, you know, now say uh, we successfully uh, collect, you know, a representative enough cohort of uh, patients and data. Do you see implications down the road in policy, uh, such as uh, public you know, uh, health or insurance and uh, deployments of resource? You know, do, do you see a way to connect this into? Uh, absolutely, and I think uh, we actually have uh, an example with the study I showed you on personalized nutrition. This is an example where in Israel we, we actually have done it. So uh, when we published the study, uh, you know, so we measured a thousand people, we developed this algorithm, we went to the biggest HMOs. There's only four HMOs in Israel. Everybody by law has to be in one of them. And right now, the two large HMOs, which cover 75% of all people in Israel, they, they decided that uh, this technology is good, the, the personalized nutrition one, and they have adopted it and have been subsidizing it for all of their uh, uh, patient uh, base. And uh, this has been, um, you know, it's really changed the policy because dietitians were trained on this technology. Now it's part of the offering uh, for the purpose of uh, preventing uh, preventative medicine, so preventing uh, disease. So I think insights that you find could, you know, lead to uh, new ways of diagnosis that could, that, that, that's the idea, that they would go into, uh, to change policy in, in terms of public health. Maybe there would be some tests that you would identify that would be really key to identify subsets of high-risk populations that you can intervene uh, early on in. So, so I think there, there's many, many different um, uh, uh, effects on, uh, of policies on public health, and we have examples of that already in Israel. Yeah, thank you. Uh, maybe one last question uh, on the technical area. So this obviously you know, poses a new type of challenge to AI and, uh, and uh, algorithmic research, right? So Current AI is based on, as you know, in many other areas, large data, you know, a big you know, assumptions on homogeneity, and then train large models, right? So in here, uh, even though, you know, we are aiming for collecting very large data set, but uh, statistically speaking, they are, you know, very, very small in terms of uh, the statistical efficiencies and the information contents. Do you see, you know, uh, any, uh, directions or uh, any suggestions on how, you know, AI research evolved down the road, you know, in both, you know, learning effective populational models to understand disease versus personalized recommendations and treatment and, uh, and design, you know, uh, that are more kind of uh, relevant to applications. Yeah, yeah, I think that's, that's an excellent question. And I think, I, I think you're right. And we are working on some of it. I, we're looking at other developments uh, uh, in, in the world on it. But yeah, this data poses a lot of challenges to AI. I think there won't be just one approach to overcome it. Um, I can mention a few. So uh, I think bringing in uh, 
prior knowledge is, is going to be key. So, um, you know, I, I think you're right that even, even if we measured a million people, just because so many, there are so many dimensions in, in this data, statistically this would be relatively small compared to the dimensions of data that we have. So, so the classic thing that you need to do in machine learning to address that is to somehow restrict the model space that you're looking at. And I think one way to restrict that model space would be to, to use prior knowledge. There may be uh, you know, other ways to, to restrict it. Maybe if you see uh, congruence of uh, information on multiple layers of data, um, like I showed, you know, uh, uh, if you see the, not only uh, the blood marker that changes, but also the bacteria that affects that blood marker then on two different layers of data, that probably means that this uh, finding is more likely to be correct than a random finding on some other metabolite which could have arisen because of uh, not enough statistical power. Uh, so, so I think really there's going to be, there are many different challenges uh, that will be posed to AI by addressing, uh, by, 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 for extracting the most amount of uh, insights from this very diverse data. Uh, do we have time for a couple more questions, Ethan? Yeah. I'm fine. All right, great. I have two more. Thank you, Errol, for this amazing presentation and um, Thank you. amazing project. I want to have one question, which is besides this um, um, very you know, rich library you have collected and detailed associations between disease and bacteria, let's say, and, and even causal relationships, have you so far from this year's process learned a better or interesting story on how life works in general, which will inevitably lead to a different or interesting public health advice? Thank mm -hmm. you. Yeah, that's a, that's a very uh, interesting and, and broad question. I'm, I'm, I mean, I think the, the main thing I'll say that, that we learned are, uh, well, maybe a few things, actually, if I think about it. So I think we learned that um, in my view, environmental factors really dominate over genetic predisposition for at least for, um, for everything, N not for you know, early life onset uh, developmental diseases which are like one gene and very strong effects, but for all of the diseases that we're talking about in older uh, life, like the, the, I, I think there is genetic predisposition, but I think the environment really dominates over that, which is why I think all of these measurements are really important. So I think that's, that's one insight that, um, that we learned. And maybe related to that, but somewhat different, is, is that we really need to look at many different layers of data because uh, the information is, is never just present in one layer of data. And, and I think also going back to Eric, Eric's question, I think by doing that, uh, that will also help us to narrow down the space of where the true answer is because we'll see it on different uh, layers of data and won't, won't be just a random finding on, on one type of data. So I don't know if that fully answers the question, but those are some insights that I think we've been getting. Um, yes, thank you very much. Uh, my question is a very simple one. As you're gathering these oceans of data and um, allowing people to run their own algorithms on this data, how do you deal with the risk of medical rumors and of uh, uh, misleading hypotheses spreading and uh, leading to wild goose chases and wrong uh, therapeutic approaches and commercial interests actually misusing this uh, facility to run their own algorithms and so forth? Um, yeah, I think that, that's, that's a good question that I, 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 I don't, I'm not sure that uh, no, this probably won't only be up to us to be able to do this, but I think that in the end, data in general, this type of data for sure, but, but you know, in general, any data, it has to be, its use eventually to the public has to be regulated, and there should be these layers of uh, regulation um, that, I, I mean, I'm, I'm, that, that I think are very important. I'm not sure that we are the best ones to be dealing with that, but I think those are also important issues that would need to be to be thought of. Uh, you know what? Uh, uh, what? Um, yeah. How do you how do you eventually um, bring products to people, and, and what you would need to to show before you actually market products to people? 
You need a lot of human intelligence to actually evaluate the output of all this artificial intelligence. I, I, absolutely. I, I don't think we're, I mean, yeah, I mean, I think in general, nobody um, who I think works in AI thinks that AI is going, to, is going to move humans out of the equation. I think it's just going to help with certain tasks, but then, um, you know, we'll still need humans for doing many more things. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much, Professor Segal. Let's give him a big round of applause, please. Thank you. And we'd like to invite you to stay for some food, actually. So enjoy. Thank you. Sure. Great. Thank you so much. I will see you in the evening. Okay, excellent. Good, good, good. Thanks. Oh, yeah, yeah. I don't want you to be Yeah.